Uh, let me explain what's going on. Um, you all may have saw the schedule and said, Family Matters? That was a TV show back in the 90s. Um, I don't know if all, all, if all y'all know that. But the point today is we're going to do an interactive session um, that's going to include a variety of different things, including hearing from our distinguished speakers, including Brother Neil Bramson, Brother Samuel B. Thomas, and Brother Christian Ramirez. Um, but it'll also include a time of discussion, and a time of exploration, and a time of really seeking out what God desires of my life, and how can I accomplish that desire for His glory. And so I hope the time we do spend together uh, will be fruitful. Um, just a few things to lay down real quick. We have split you all up into two age groups. I hope you weren't too offended. Uh, but we thought it might be more comfortable sitting with maybe some your direct peers because we are going to have a time of discussion and time of sharing. And so we do have the 20 and under crowd to my right, you all's left, over here on this last section. And we have the 21 to 40 crowd right here in this section in the middle. And then we have the 41 to 60 crowd right here in this middle section. And we have the six, uh, 61 and up crowd on the very, my very far left. And all of, all of y'all have uh, particular roles and functions you play in your lives and your societies. And some of that comes with age and some of it comes with just where you come from. But our goal is to have a fruitful time of discussion and conversation today. So before we get on to it, I'll open up in a word of prayer. And uh, then we'll get into more details of what we're doing today. Okay. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this time. I thank you that you've gathered each and every one of us here in your divine power. No one is here by accident, Father. And so we pray as we spend time together communicating with each other and communicating with your word and through your word and uh, into our future, oh, Father, I pray that we are um, uh, submissive and yielding and open to the working of the Holy Spirit in our life and in this time. We hope to be able to discuss and engage in a variety of topics of Father, but mostly we hope to find out what honors and pleases you and how can we accomplish that. So we just ask, uplift this time, uplift every single person who's gathered here, and I pray that the time we spend will be fruitful and glorified to your name. And be with those who are still coming, Lord, let it be a time again that honors your name. I pray all these things in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, um, can we go back to the first slide real quick? Can we go to the first slide? Okay. Or the next slide, sorry. I thought that was it. Okay, so you guys are in your age groups. And our hope today, we have you gathered here as families. As mothers, fathers, children, grandparents, brothers, sisters. We're here as families. And our goal is to be able to have a conversation and a dialogue about maybe some of the, the good things God is doing in our lives as families, but maybe some of the not so good things, some of the problems that might come up in family life. And our goal is to try to address them in a way that is very open and uh, non-judgmental, but in a way that may challenge some belief systems, but might affirm some good practices. And so we've divided this time into three sections. Uh, the first section includes a scenario, a case study thing. We will present a case study to each and every one of you that you will uh, evaluate and then answer three questions about. After that, we'll have a time of biblical framework where three panelists will come forward and based on the scenario and the thoughts that we've shared and uh, more importantly, based on the Word of God, they're going to share uh, the wisdom upon that scenario and upon our lives and how to tackle some of the issues. And afterward, Get ready for it. There's going to be an open forum where you and each and one of you can ask the uh, panelists questions, but they might ask you all questions as well to see if you're paying attention and to see how we can apply these things. So again, I really do want to emphasize thank you for being here and being open to what the Lord is doing here today. And I'm excited and I hope that as we leave from this place, we are all deeply encouraged by what the Lord is doing. Today is a good day that the Lord has prepared for us and I'm excited for what He's going to do. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I'm going to throw, it's going to be the next scenario. It's going to be the actual scenario. And I'm going to read it out loud and you can follow along. Um, this is not based on a true story, though you might see some things, but I'm going to read it out loud. Jack and Jill have one son, Jonah. Jonah is a Christian, but not baptized. He neglects his time with the Lord, is uninterested in family prayer time, and has no desire to share the gospel with his friends. 
Jack and Jill are concerned about his behavior and try to encourage Jonah to engage in these Christian activities. Jack, Jill, and Jonah all seem frustrated and helpless. Can everyone see that as well from the audience? Perfect. And so what we're going to ask you all to do is in your age groups, and maybe with just three to four, please, no more than four people, just pair up maybe in your row with three or four people and answer these three questions. How would you describe Jonah's situation and Jack and Jill's situation? What choices could Jonah have made that led him to this point? And what choices have his parents made to contribute to this point? Before we move on, any questions about... Oh, sorry. Can y'all hear me now? Did y'all not hear anything I said? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so our goal is in your age group that you will pair up with three to four maximum people and discuss what's happening in that scenario, evaluate it, and answer those three questions um, as honestly and as biblically as you can. But like, the most important thing is really try to be honest and open about what's happening there in that scenario. And so we're going to give you guys about maybe 10 minutes to do that. And after that, we'll have a microphone going around. We might, we might get some responses from the audience and what you guys discussed. Um, so, go ahead. And you don't know if I'll come to you with the microphone, so I think everyone should be ready, uh, prepared to do the answers for this question. Why? It is written there, Jonah is a Christian. So we assume he is born again. Then it says he is not baptized. Other than that, he is not baptized. He is Jonah. അപ്പോൾ <laughs> ജാക്ക് അഞ്ചിൽ ഇവന്റെ മാതാപിതാവിന് ഇവന്റെ ഈ ഉത്സാഹമില്ലാത്ത ക്രിസ്തീയ ജീവിതം അല്ലെങ്കിൽ വാഞ്ചയില്ലാത്ത ദൈവിക കാര്യത്തിൽ വാഞ്ചയില്ലാത്ത ഈ സ്വഭാവം അവരെ ഒത്തിരി അരട്ടുന്നുണ്ട് അതുകൊണ്ട് അവരെന്താ ചെയ്ത ജോനായെ ആത്മീയ കാര്യങ്ങളെല്ലാം പ്രോത്സാഹിപ്പിക്കാൻ ഇവിടെ വന്നു കിടക്കുന്നത് ജോന നമുക്ക് സഭയിൽ പോകണം മീറ്റിംഗിന് പോകണം കുടുംബ പ്രാർത്ഥനക്കിരിക്കണം ബൈബിൾ വായിക്കണം പാട്ട് പാടണം അവനെ ഇങ്ങനെ വിളിച്ചു വന്ന് ചിലപ്പോൾ ഒക്കെ ശാസിക്കുകയും ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ ഞാൻ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നു അപ്പൊ ഈ കാര്യങ്ങളൊക്കെ ഉത്സാഹിപ്പിക്കുവാൻ ജാക്ക് ആൻഡ് ജോ ഒത്തിരി ശ്രമിക്കുന്നു എന്നാൽ അതിന്റെ ഒടുവിൽ ഒരു കാര്യം എഴുതിയിട്ടുണ്ട് ജാക്ക് ആൻഡ് ജോ ആൻഡ് ജോ ആർ ഓൾ സീ ഫ്രസ്ട്രേറ്റഡ് ഇതൊക്കെ ചെയ്തിട്ടും ചെയ്തിട്ടും ഇവരുടെ പ്രശ്നം അറിഞ്ഞിട്ടും ഇവർ മൂന്ന് പേരും മനസ്സിലാകില്ല ഇനി എന്തുവാ ചെയ്യേണ്ടത് അതുകൊണ്ട് അവര് നിരാശ ഇതാണ് കേസ് ഇതിന്റെ കീഴെ കുറെ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻസ് ഉണ്ട് ആദ്യത്തെ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ജോനയുടെ സിറ്റുവേഷൻ നമ്മൾ എങ്ങനെ എങ്ങനെ അത് എക്സ്പ്ലെയിൻ ചെയ്യുന്നു രണ്ടാമത് ഈ മാതാപിതാക്കൾ ജാക്ക് ആൻഡ് ജിന്റെ സിറ്റുവേഷൻ എങ്ങനെയാ നമ്മൾ കാണുന്നത് പിന്നെ ജോന ഇങ്ങനെ ഒരു പയ്യൻ ഒരു പൈതൽ ആകാൻ ഇങ്ങനൊരു വിശ്വാസിയാകാൻ ഏതെല്ലാം കാരണം താൽ അവൻ ഇങ്ങനെ ആയി തീർന്നു ആ കാരണങ്ങൾ നമുക്ക് കണ്ടുപിടിക്കാം പിന്നെ ഉടനത്തത് ഇവന്റെ മാതാപിതാക്കൾ അതായത് ജാക്ക് ആൻഡ് ജിനു അവര് എന്ത് ചെയ്യാൻ സാധിക്കും അതായത് അവരുടെ മുന്നിൽ എന്ത് ഏത് ചോയ്സ് ഉണ്ട് ഈ ഈ ഈ പ്രശ്നത്തിൽ നിന്ന് മോനെ 
വെളിയിൽ കൊണ്ടുവാനോ അഭിമുഖീകരിക്കുവാനോ മാതാപിതാക്കൾ അതായത് ഡാറ്റ് എന്തോ ചെയ്യാൻ സാധിച്ചു ഞാൻ വേറൊരു കേസ് വന്നു അറ്റ് ദ സെയിം പ്ലേസ്
hey, wait a minute, he's, he's not coming to church, or he's not uh, spending time with us, or in family time, or prayer. And so then they start putting the pieces together as to what's been wrong, but it's a little too late in the sense that they can't enforce or build those, put those foundational blocks that should have been done over time. And he's, he's, a, he's, you know, sounds like he's still at home, so he's a semi-adult and independent, and so you can't uh, quite uh, go back to perhaps being, you know, strict or uh, things you would do when kids are, you know, the five or eight or ten years or eleven years of age, kind of those uh, years of correcting. So uh, he's, he's, a, he's a young man, so to speak. And the parents are also frustrated because now they've got to handle the situation from an adult perspective. And there's probably some feedback from Jonah because he resists some of their, uh, I would say, pushing to correct course. And there's some feedback because he says, hey, I'm an adult and I don't feel like doing what you're telling me to do. Uh, so it's, uh, in a way, it's like putting in a fence post. That's the way I see it. When you first put a fence post in, you dig a hole. And if the, if the, the post leads to the left or the right, you've got time to correct it before you drop all that concrete in. You've got time to put that fence post straight up. And even after the concrete goes in, you've still got time to straighten that out. But once it's set, it's done. So it's, it's kind of the situation that the parents and where Jonah's in is they're all adults and they all have different perspectives at this point. And the foundations are missing. And obviously, like uh, less and less there's a communication gap. So all that's added to where they're at right now. Thank you for sharing, I appreciate that. Uh, can I get a volunteer in this, in this middle section right here? One brave volunteer. If not, our dear brother told him we'll pick someone. And he's standing near some people. Anyone? Just some thoughts or comments about this scenario? I hear some children say, Mom, Dad. <laughs> okay. So you still have peer pressure in your 40s. <laughs> that never goes away. <sighs> so um, it's very, probably, you know, when it says, you know, how do you describe the situation? Probably very common. Um, it's interesting, we were talking, and, you know, we they had asked, like, what choices could have led to the decision um, from either end. There can be so many. Personally, as a parent, you know, I pray to the Lord and I still screw up. And I pray about the way I screwed up and then I mess up again. And so, and then sometimes I see something in my child and I think, how did I do that? You know, so we don't ever really know exactly. But, you know, we can all speculate. There's all, we all have sin. Um, but what we were saying is that really what seemed to be missing was what are we going to do now going forward? That was a question I think that seems missing. Um, because when you look at the case study, there's nothing about either of them. Obviously, Jonah's not walking with the Lord, but even the parents, they are trying to do many things, but what's not there is prayer. And I think we spend, as parents, a lot of times doing, talking, um, and trying to encourage, which may come off as nagging, um, but we need to spend less time being the Holy, their Holy Spirit and more time um, asking the Holy Spirit to work on that. So, kind of answer the question and kind of made up our own. <laughs> so much. Great answer. Okay. The last section. Uh, the Golden Club. Can I... Uh... No, there's a lot of wisdom. So I would love to hear one person, please volunteer just to share your thoughts. It could be in English or Malayalam, whatever feels most comfortable. But I would love, would love to hear um, your thoughts on the scenario and maybe some answers to these questions. Does anyone be willing just to share that? We greatly appreciate it. Oh, 
Okay, yeah. thank you, Uncle. I appreciate that. No one can get staying in front of this field. <laughs> no, we're all about on the ground. Don't worry about it. The me. first question, how would you describe your, the situation? It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but we need to consider, you know, the Bible says, train up a child when you ask the end. So say was that some of the dear brothers or they have said that to one you. It was a little bit late. This, I think it's these three people they were adults. Okay, they all are frustrated. But one thing he may be this son is maybe frustrated because it may be as a parent we all do that sometimes. We say one thing in front of the people, we now say we act differently. So when this parents call him, well, let's, son, come over here, let's pray. But in the back of the mind, he said, okay, dad, you tell me, or mom, you tell me to pray, but I know what you do, you know. So there may be something is bothering him to come to sit. But he don't see any meaning what they were trying to do. Hmm. So the best, I think, situation is, all need to be back up a little bit and be patient, wait, then pray to God. I think God can do miracles. You know, what is impossible to man, it is possible to God. Amen. I think that is the best thing to do. I know this is a situation in every family, one way or other, is we are facing, as a parents, we are facing it. But I think one thing we need to do is, we need to train them when they are very young, then after that, I think we need to be practically in front of them, in front of them. Otherwise, you know, this young generation, even though they act like in front of us, but they will be a different baby outside, especially with their amounts. So we need to we need a pray and put in practice what we say. Thank you. Thank you, God. I appreciate that. Um, I'll do one more if anyone wants to. Just raise your hand real quick. Anyone wants to share from any age group? Like, there's something was laid on your heart or you, you saw something in this and you just, you really want to share, just raise your hand up and we'll bring the microphone to you. We would love to hear you. Yes. Okay. I think Uncle mentioned everything that I wrote in my book, so I just wanted to add, uh, uh, I think it's our. Uh, I'm a parent too, but a young parent. Uh, but just going through this case study comes to our my mind uh, specifically is uh, I don't know if that is say I'm brutally honest with you to say this that sometimes we are so prone to condemn it. Um, you know, when we see something wrong in front of us, or when we see a co brother, for instance, going through uh, a backslidden speed, we are so kind of close to excited to share that with somebody else and gossip and things like that. Uh, that is a trend, unfortunately, that has come to our Christendom, and we all would have to accept that. But, on the contrary, if that is happening in our family, our physical uh, family, we would not ever do that to share the gospel. So we all say that we are children of God, we are one godly family, as one family under God, but practically we fail there. So what I, uh, just alongside what I'm was sharing, uh, which I have my points as well, but what we have to stop, this is uh, being a parent, young parent, uh, uh, I also live to myself too. We have to practice what we preach. Uh, long story short, and we have to stop condemning, comparing our children with others. Look at that child. He's doing great. So that is not going to have any positive influence on our children. So we have to stop. I'm sorry, I'm being blunt when I say this. We need to stop that right there. And condemning or gossiping. We have to stop that too. Rather, we need to correct ourselves, correct our lives, and then be a role model. And then our actions speak the words to the child. Not our words. We have to uh, be behind, we have to stop being behind. Uh, as a young, young parent, I also do that, so I'm looking back to myself, and that's an area I need to correct myself. 
We sometimes are behind saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But at the end of the day, I think it's all should be coming out of love. The, the child should feel that my parents are this to me because of their love for me. And they should see the love, not through words, but by actions. So the root is love. When love sustains, everything would come to place. So I think if we connect that dot with love for every instance in the scenario, everything will be connected well and we would never ever have any Jonas in our circle. So let's hope the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother, for sharing. And thank you to thank you for each of you who shared and participated and uh, can we talked about this issue. Again, I just want to be very clear. You know, as we are planning this scenario, we wanted to talk about something that was real. You know, we could have another session, but we just kind of come and avoid any hard topics or issues. And so I appreciate all the people who stood up and shared uh, kind of openly and vulnerably about maybe an experience or something they've seen, but to analyze the scenario to kind of see what's going on. And we've identified kind of several issues and some of the contributing factors and y'all had, had a chance to talk about it. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to invite up uh, Brother Nate, uh, Brother Samuel, and Brother Christian to come forward and join us on this, uh, join, join me on this stage. And I'm really just going to turn it over to them and they're going to kind of give us a, a biblical framework for assessing this scenario and really how we move forward. So go ahead and make you come up. to give us a biblical framework to understanding this scenario and addressing even some of the issues you heard today and moving forward. Hello everybody, thank you for those wonderful thoughts. I have a younger brother who lives in Houston, his name is Sanju, you all know. He has two sons and now one more daughter that is added to his family. What are the name of those two sons? Danny Lynn, Timothy, I'm giving you another case now <laughs> to understand this better. And I stayed there this time, uh, six, seven, eight, three days. So the Sanju is in the living room, Daniel is in my room, and Timothy is in another room. From the front room, Sanju calls, Daniel, come here. Daniel responds, why? So he waits, Daniel will come. Come, come. He doesn't go. So Daniel does not go. So he finishes off his hope from Daniel. He has another son, thank God, Timothy. <laughs> Timothy, come here. Wow. <laughs> and I'm listening. The third one is just three weeks. She can walk. <laughs> and she can't go. And she will not call. The next tone is Daniel. Nobody goes to a father. Finally, I go. <laughs> and he stands up. I said, why did you come? Because nobody came. <laughs> I, I bring both the sons to the father. And I tell the sons, I'm not discouraging you to ask the question why. But I am encouraging you to at least respect him as a father who called them. And I told Sanju, Sanju, they are boys, they are growing up. They will ask questions and I don't discourage them for their questions. I come to the first point I think Brother Blessing said. Communication is vital in the family. And uh, actually Daniel and Timothy, they were encouraging the father to be more communicative. Am I right? Am I right? I don't remember in my, in my, when I was growing up and when my father used to call asking why I used to stand like this and go, 
I used to stand like this, but I can't expect Daniel and Timothy or our children to do like that. I, I really don't do that. I encourage them to ask questions. And to, I told my brother, be communicative, talk to them. How, why do you call them and for what purpose you call them and why should they do it? Communicate to them. The sad part is we don't have time for communication. Right? So, uh, this is a very general situation back in India. We, we practice this model of case study and it is very effective. And I'd like to give you a model uh, which I preached in FIBA 2013. Um, this model was shown in the PowerPoint and I would like to reiterate that. There are uh, four aspects of parenting. Number one is the parents as Jacob's, Jacob's wife very, very pertinently started. That is the foundation. She needs a big clap. Really, that is the foundation that we need to. That is a prayer. Go back to the basics. You go back to the basics. You can't have a fascinating, sophisticated model than that. And that is the basics of parenting. You have to shed tears. You have to be on your knees. You have to run. You have to... Work hard in prayer for your kids if you want them. The second one is teaching and talking. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7. Can you, can you all please take that uh, portion of the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. Teaching and talking. Now when we say communication, that word gives us the how to communicate. There is a, there's a beautiful technique of communicating. That is a beautiful passage for painting. Okay, so the model is first is prayer, second is teaching and talking. Well, can you read that? Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. From verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. That means the teaching part is so informal. When you lie down, when you sit down, when you are on the dinner table, in your lunch table, in your bedroom, in your family room, it is an informal thing inside the home. Every moment I'm teaching and educating my child. The teaching and talking that comes there and you see the, the, the aspects of teaching and talking. Third one, love them by recognizing obedience. Now Ranjit, Brother Ranjit was spot on. I don't know how many of you uh, understood what he said. He was spot on. You know what he was talking about? We don't recognize and appreciate the obedience of our children, but we are so quick to condemn our children. Am I right? Am I right? Small act of obedience need recognition. It's a bad on them. Lift up their chin. Lift up their chin. Oh my daughter, what a work you have done. You have cut the grass to its, to its best. <laughs> Am I right? I take this five dollars. <laughs> you know, our nature is to condemn. And it, it becomes so difficult for us to appreciate. Identify your child to be unique and appreciate your child. Be, be patient, be patient, be patient. The third one is Ephesians 6 4, the second part. Educate them, teach them, talk them. Talk to them, recognize them, and the next one is educate them. Now that is hard work. Now this is formal education. Okay, we have to educate them. I have not outsourced my child's spiritual growth to vacation Bible school and to the local church. Did you listen to that? I am not supposed to outsource of training my child to the vacation Bible school and to my local church. The first school of educating a child spiritually is my home. And today what we have done? We have outsourced it 
to children's organization and to the local church Sunday school. Very sad to say that. I can't escape that responsibility. I have to educate my child. I have to teach my child how to do quiet time. I have to teach my child how to do personal Bible study. I have to teach my child how to resist the devil. I have to teach my child how to see sin as sin and how to see God as God. I have to teach. It's my responsibility as a father. And the last one is listen to them. Please listen to them. It's fun. It's one. And let me tell you, last year, let me speak from my experience. Me and my wife, we were going through very tough physical conditions. And my elder daughter, she went into depression. She lives away from home in Pune doing her engineering. And she was pretending that she is fine. And uh, we were in the hospitals and uh, the time was very stressful, the children could not take it. And she went into depression and the assembly people, now look at this, the assembly people recognized that Kezia is not fine. And they, they called me and they said, Brother, speak to your daughter, she's not fine, she has gone into depression. How many of you will say that on the stage? I challenge you. How many of us will say that my daughter has a problem? Will you? You will not. Because we are worried of our marriage. Am I right? <laughs> How many of you will say that and stand in the assembly and say that my daughter has a depression and can you pray? Will you say that? No. My dear parents, be open, talk, accept that is a problem then only solution will come. Unless we accept that we have a problem, there will not be a solution. I had to go myself to visit her. Just after four days, or four weeks after my hospitalization, because it's my daughter, I had to go personally, sit with her, hold her, kiss her, hug her. She was crying. My dear parents, pray, listen, talk, educate, recognize. Finally, honor them with a salute. Amen. 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 So, there's two situations that I want to talk to. Uh, First of all, I think there can be a situation like this where Jack and Jill have done the right things. And I want to talk about that. Because we will have parents who are godly, who are listening to their children, who are training them up in the way of the Lord, and maybe the child will take a wrong choice. And he will decide not to follow the Lord. And for a while, I honestly believe we can pray, we can continue to pray, but it's not the parents' fault. And I just want to say that because we can be quick to judge again these parents and just say, oh, they must have done something wrong. You know, like we can very quickly judge them. And there are parents amongst us that can be suffering very quietly because their children are not walking with the Lord and they feel just so ashamed even to say that or to talk to them about that because he points back to them. So I just want to say, you know, there's an area of grace we need to give to parents who are, you know, striving to be good parents, but yet, because children are their own beings and we have, you know, volition and take our own choices, might not be walking to the Lord. So let's find grace towards also those parents. Um, also just wanted to uh, talk from the book of Jude. I think Jude has some things to tell us here. Uh, we were going with the Jude through the book of Jude, yeah, Jude. <laughs> and uh, we were saying that one of the main problems that false teachers had was that their faith did not align with their behavior. So they were professing that they were believers, but they were acting and behaving completely different. And take a look at the words that are used by Jude to describe these teachers uh, down in verse uh, 16. So they are... No, 
So shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds, fruitless trees, waves of the sea, wandering stars for whom there is darkness. So all of these images are about things that have the appearance but have the fruit. So fruitless trees, uh, waterless clouds, it's like you're supposed to have something and give something, but you're not really giving it. And that's a big issue that Jim has with his people. Uh, I'm also reminded of Matthew 22, when Jesus is going at the Pharisees, and he's saying, you guys are doing all the right external things, but for all the wrong reasons. And something that we really need to evaluate, especially as we're uh, raising our children in the Lord, is this question of, you know, why am I doing things, and why do I want my children to do things? Uh, why am I going to church or why am I doing these things? You know, it's where's my heart behind all of this. But also, what am I teaching my children their heart is behind all of this? Because I believe that as parents, sometimes we can fall in the trap of, you know, do this because other people are looking or, or do this because, you know, we're at church, you know, you're supposed to behave better here. But we're not consistent back at home and that creates hypocrisy. And I think that's the greatest deterrent of faith towards a young person or a child is is that, is hypocrisy. Uh, I think that was really good when somebody shared that. And Jude is, you know, going at that. So, something to continuously evaluate. I have to evaluate it all the time. And I have to ask myself, you know, not only children have to ask why, we need to ask why. You know, when I tell something my to my child, why am I telling him to do this? Um, back in 1 Samuel, uh, the Lord reminds us that the Lord does not see the external exterior of man, but He sees the heart. So, are we dealing with the heart of our children? Okay? Are we telling them just to behave? Or are we using situations to ask them, you know, why are you not doing this? Uh, you know, he hit somebody or he's not sharing his stories. My easy solution is share. You know, do the right action. Not caring too much about what's going in his heart. Just the external part has to be well. It takes more time and more effort to take the child apart and say like, why are you not sharing? You know, what's going on in your heart? What, what are you thinking through this? Lead him to understand their selfishness there. Help him to see that selfishness is sin and that he has to deal with, with that sin through the grace of Jesus Christ. So every opportunity I have uh, to discipline and to correct my children is an opportunity to share the gospel and to show them how Jesus can make a difference in everything that they do. Uh, so I think those are things that can be done regularly, but they take time, effort, uh, and you know, a different way of thinking from all of us. Um, and then finally, from the book of Jude, verse uh, 20, Two, uh, you know, the main action that Jude wants us to have. He's talked about the false teachers. He's talked about the believers. Now, what do we do? Verse 22 says, have mercy on those who doubt. Uh, and I want to stop there for one second. Because that's very key. You know, we are, within our families, we can have those who doubt. We could have children that are doubting. And, and Jonah could be very much doubting his faith. Uh, now, it's very important that he understands that he receives mercy from the people that are closest to him, and that will be his parents. You know, how do we show them mercy? I was sharing with the young people as well uh, a while ago. My daughter, she's small, but she has big questions. And we were in the park, and she was like sitting really sad in a corner, and I sat with her and I talked to her. And you know what's wrong? It's like, uh, I'm thinking about something. Like, what are you thinking about? I don't want to tell you. Why do you want to tell me? Because maybe you'll get mad or you'll get sad. Now I'm really interested in knowing what's going on. Uh, so I keep talking to her. I so you can tell me anything. Don't worry about it. And then she looks at me with like cloudy eyes, like she's tearful. It's like, Daddy, I don't know if I believe in God. Uh, and like, this is like an honest question from her. Like, I really don't know. I'm not the way you do. And I'm, I'm scared because maybe you are going to be mad with me. 
that I have to sit down with her and tell her, Gabby, no matter what, Daddy will always love you because God loves you no matter if you believe in Him or do not believe in Him. And it makes me sad because I have a great God and I want you to share in His goodness and His greatness. But I will love you and He will love you and I will pray for you. And I know that God will reveal Himself to you at some point. And in the meantime, please know that I'm praying, I'm telling you about God, and I am sharing this love with you. Uh, you know, that was just, she just hugged me and she cried and I cried and we, we both cried for a while. There. Uh, but that was very eye-opening to me to see that I can make a career for her in the way I react to questions, in the way I react uh, to things around me. It can set either a, a barrier between me and her, or it can make an open way for her to communicate. And I think that's very important. So show mercy on those who doubt. Uh, so if some of us or some of our children are doubting, the way we address that is very important. You know, do we tell them, no, just, you, you just have to do it. Why? Uh, well, because, I don't know, if you don't do it, it will be shameful for our family. Well, we have to manage the heart, okay, first. And that will lead their heart to the Lord, which I think is what we want. Fabulous. I appreciate the thoughts have been shared. And definitely just going to build off of some of these things. The, the first question I think that comes to my mind in relation to parenting specifically is what is our big objective in the sense of what, what do we actually desire for our kids? Because I think it's very easy to desire an external response. And it's like we want our kids to look a certain way in order that we might not be shamed. In other words, uh, perhaps as a parent you feel more uh, honorable in a sense if your kids do attend all the church meetings, they stay in the local assembly and don't go to another local church. They gladly attend uh, any times of prayer in the home uh, voluntary and not just uh, out of compulsion. Uh, they do the right things. And if I pull, and don't worry, I'm going to be talking to these young people in a second, so uh, don't, don't, no one should feel targeted here. So I ask you though, if your kids did everything that Jonah is supposed to be doing, would you be happy? If you say yes, I think there is a problem. That's not the objective and the goal. And so I like to start with the end in mind. What are we actually desiring? I have an eight week old daughter. And as I pray over her, very little of my prayer has to do with the external, as in what she's going to do, any kind of career. I don't care a lick what career. I don't care if she's a doctor, and I don't care if she cleans floors at a local school. I do not care. What I do care about my daughter is I care that whether she eats or whether she drinks or whatever she does, she does it to the glory of God. I care that, like Micah 6, 8 as well, he is showing you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. My only desire for my daughter, just like you mentioned for your daughter, and I completely agree, Christian, with the, the way you said, talk about doubters, and we'll talk about that tonight, so I'm not going to go to June 22 right now, the evening session will be on that passage, but my only desire for my daughter is that she tastes and sees that the Lord is good. So now we take that to another angle of this whole perspective. And that is, and I think it was well mentioned by some of your, your comments during the, the discussion time. But this really comes out very strongly to me when we talk about communication. Because as we seek to communicate to Jonah in this example, the, 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 the value of Jesus Christ, and you brothers brought this out so clearly, I think it's beautiful that as a father, we get to show the character of our Heavenly Father, but oftentimes our kids miss it for a couple simple reasons. And we mentioned it, hypocrisy, pharisaical living. And when I say that, don't be discouraged. You see, pharisaical living is actually a choice, and I just got to stand because 
I get too excited about this in the city and I can't quite get excited. But let me share with you just something that happened in my own home growing up. And this made all the difference. I really believe all the difference in seeing the gospel. We all admit, and sister, you mentioned it, none of us are going to be perfect parents, and we know that. But that's not the point. The point was never whether or not we're going to be perfect. You see, God gave us a very special gift, but it's a gift I really, truly believe that I'm speaking truth here, and please listen. I believe that when you look at Romans 1 and you see the list of sins, first of all, it started with unthankfulness, but one of the first sins mentioned before disobedience to parents is a haughty spirit. I want to ask a very simple question to every parent in the audience, because this is the most powerful thing my father ever did in parenting me, and it showed me the character of Christ probably more clearly than any other attribute. How many of you regularly go to your kids and apologize to them when your character does not line up with your Heavenly Father? When you raise your voice in anger, do you go and say, I am sorry, that did not reflect God the Father? When you gossip about them unnecessarily, do you go and apologize and say, I'm sorry, I committed one of the sins that God hates in Proverbs? I can tell you right away, the two most powerful things my father ever said to me was, I love you, which he says every time he writes me to this day. And the second thing was, I'm sorry. Now let me tell you a little fun thing for all you fathers out there. And God knows my heart. I cannot remember absolutely one thing my dad ever apologized for. All I know is he apologized a lot. I don't remember his sins. I remember his heart. And here's the thing. Because of that, when I think of my father, I cannot ever think of any hypocrisy. I can't say that of many people. My dad didn't have two faces, a public and private, and the reason was because he was very quick to repent. To this day, he does. Now, I don't share this to talk about dad. I share this to talk about my true heavenly father. When I look at this example, I want to share something incredibly encouraging, I think, with all of you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we're told something about our life, and now I'm going to address you all, too. Now, the interesting thing is I'm not really aiming at you because what I'm about to share is for all of us, and I hope it's a practical takeaway that encourages your heart greatly. It does mine. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, listen to what Paul says about our lives. He says this, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a, our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. What I want to encourage all of us is we are a letter being read. You're a letter being read, and obviously, you all are a letter being read. But here's the thing. Jonah might be frustrated himself, but clearly Jack and Jill are frustrated. There was, it, it, I've been married 16 months, so I, I feel I'm probably the most unqualified married man. Abel, maybe you're a little less. You've been married less than me, but I'm one of the most unqualified married men in this room to speak. I understand, so please, I am not dogmatically saying things on marriage. But I do want to share with you a lesson God taught me immediately, and it applies to this situation. You know, when you enter into marriage, you can quickly have expectations. And the Holy Spirit burdened me immediately into marriage, saying, Nathan, whenever you see something that you want changed, you are the first one I want to change. It was actually free. That's not bondage. I realized my wife's never the issue. My heart's the issue. Because think about this. When Jonah, or let me just for a second take Christian's daughter, since we're making things very personal here. See, if Chris, or Christian, however you want to refer to him, if he didn't have a daughter, 
that said what she said, she would never taste your love in the way that she's tasting your love. Now she knows her dad as an unconditional lover, whereas before she never knew that your love extended as far as for her to say, I'm not sure I believe in your God. And all of a sudden she realized, hang on, dad still loves me. This situation I see as an opportunity. Parents, you get to show Jonah a love you'll never get to show him if he simply externally obeys you. You can show him a grace and kindness that Christ showed me countless times before being saved and countless times since being saved. Don't see this as a ruined situation. See it as a platform for the gospel. Your life is being read. It's a gospel. Good news of Christ through your compassion, through your mercy, through the grace you show. If you have a child in this situation, I just want to encourage you and say, not only is, not the, situ not only is the situation not over, get excited. This is the situation for you to put Jesus Christ and his character on display. For you younger people, your parents are never the problem. Never. Maybe they're not doing things right sometimes. They're still not the problem. You have a choice to respond in a godly way. You have a choice to ultimately please the Lord. And maybe you completely disagree with a tradition, not a doctrine, a tradition they seem to be imposing on you. But really the big question is not what they're trying to do. The question is whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, are you glorifying God in your attitude or are you grumbling and disputing? Are you choosing to let this be an opportunity for you to let Christ's character come out? And I just want to challenge you, that's what's going to change the parenting more than anything, is when they see something in their kids saying, that's what I want in my life. So I challenge everyone, be encouraged. This is not a situation of failure. This is a situation where faith can be applied and God can be glorified. Amen. Amen. And <clears throat> thank you so much for um, very much illuminating um, what's going on in this scenario, but more importantly, what God is speaking to us through his word into this situation. And I, my hope is that as we've been listening to these brothers share, and as we've been hearing even from each other, from the audience, is that um, our minds are turning and our hearts are stirred and wandering. And this isn't about a blame situation. Brother Nate just put it perfectly. We're all fallen people, each and every one of us, from the infant who's born to the, to the last person who will see the Lord. We've all fallen people. And we all need a savior. The challenge of our times is how can we best experience and live out the love of Christ? Because ultimately, it's not about us. There's a world of people out there who don't have parents, who don't have children. There are people out there who are lost, who don't experience the love of God in any way, shape, or form. And if they can taste and witness the love of the saints, especially in the context of family, what an impact we could make. There are so many places the church can't go that each of us go. As families, you enter into the schools and the PTAs, you enter into the college admission offices, you enter into the workplaces. We'll never be there. But if they witness your love for each other, if they witness the grace and compassion, the humility family members can have with each other, what a powerful impact that could have. And so what I want to do with just the remaining few minutes that we have, because our panelists here, they really do, we do want to be as responsive to specific issues. And I really want to appreciate how vulnerable and honest you have been here with us. That's so important. I think we need that, not only in the family, but in the assembly. And so if there's anyone in the audience that has any questions about this scenario, or even just about where do we go from here, 
Because this is not a lost situation. Nothing is far from the hands of God. Nothing is too far from redemption. And so, is there any questions that you may have that you would like to share? Just you could raise your hand or stand up. One of our um, members will come with the microphone. Please, don't be shy. This is a, don't leave with any unanswered questions. Don't leave here without at least once. Just share. You know, we, we want our families to be a shining example in this world. So if anyone has any questions. Uh, so the question I have is, um, especially as Indian parents, we always have high expectations on our children. So how can we have the right kind of expectations, both I mean, from the parents' side and the kids regarding the parents? So the question that was just spoken was, uh, or just asked was, how can we have, as parents and as children, proper expectations of each other? So, children of their parents and parents of their children. I'll say something quickly, and then I'll pass it off to brothers who probably will have a much more clear answer. But uh, I think we have to be careful about our expectations being uh, being simply generic, especially when it's coming from parent to child. Every child is extremely different. So if you're making your expectations something on the external, uh, you're you're really we're, we're really trying to put a child into a mold. Whereas we got to go to the Word of God. The Word of God is the foundation. And so again, it comes back to what really is my expectation. Well, I, I think expectation is even the wrong word. I think it's what's my desire and how am I. How am I doing everything to give my child the greatest opportunity to see the character of God? But my expectation is not that my child behaves necessarily in a certain way, but rather ultimately that, uh, that, that my child encounters Christ as clearly as possible. So if I was answering your question, I would say my expectation is actually on myself, not on my child. Because I have to be responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit day in and day out. And I think for children to parents, um, you can easily put expectations on your parents when you start to compare. But please understand, did God make a mistake when he put you in the family in which he put you? Absolutely not. He entrusted you to that set of parents and vice versa. And so please, always, don't work from a, a deficit perspective. Work from the perspective of God that this is not about you expecting your parents to do something. Because when you stand before God, whether you're, if you're a believer on this day of, when I say judgment, I mean the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, it says nothing about your parents. You will give account for the works done in the body, whether good or worthless. And the last excuse you'll ever have is, but my mom, dot, 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 but my dad, dot, dot, dot. No, no, no. You have the perfect, look, okay, I'll say this is my final phrase, I'll shut up. But don't miss the words. Every word is meant. You have the perfect opportunity to fully glorify God in the circumstances in which you find yourself today. You have the perfect opportunity to fully glorify God in the circumstances in which you find yourself today. I'd like, um, I think as parents, as parents, uh, we have this innate desire that our children do better than we did. You know, that's, that's part of parenting, you know? Like, we want our children to do better. So sometimes that means we want them to have a better future or a better economic scenario or a better living situation. I think that's part of us. That's a lot of why we do what we do, you know, why we work, how much we work. Uh, like we have this idea in our hearts and I think that's from God, you know, that's part of parenting. We want the best for our children. Uh, 
And what I'm hearing about expectations is, you know, how do we, how do we push our children to be their best and to be better, uh, but at the same time without choking them in that sense. <laughs> and I find that it's very important that we ask ourselves, where are we getting these expectations from? You know, that we analyze, why do we have those expectations? Because maybe we'll get to a point where we're clashing. I have certain kinds of expectations, and my children have different kinds of expectations. And then, you know, a war arises. Uh, James chapter 4 reminds us something very important. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that, you're, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and do not obtain, so you fight and burrow. So James points to the heart uh, of our problems and our quarrels and our fights, even within parents or children, as to our desires, our passions. Because we don't have what we really want, then we get out of the way and we're willing to sin to be able to get it, to obtain it. Uh, and that can work from a parent and from a child. You know, it could be for us as sons, you know, we want something and we want it really bad and we see our parents as somebody who is not giving us that, so that creates a fight, that creates a quarrel. The problem is not the thing in itself, it's the desire that I have. Because that desire is bigger than God. And because that desire is bigger than my desire for God, then I'm willing to sin against my parents and able to obtain it. The same for us as parents. You know, we may have a desire for our children, but that desire might not come from God. That desire might come from somewhere else in our hearts. And that desire can become so important that my desire for my children to be successful or my desire for my children to have certain position in life is bigger than my desire for God. So I'm willing to sin against my children in order to obtain that desire. So I think that when we're thinking about expectations, the key idea is asking ourselves, where is this expectation coming from? And is this desire and this expectation bigger than my desire to honor God as a family? Amen. I'll just say two things to wrap up. Uh, this was my problem, let me admit it. As a, as, a, as, a, as a father, as a mother, this is very practical what she said. Uh, as I was uh, training my two daughters, uh, one of the things that I was very careful was not to choke them uh, with a lot of expectations. But, yes, I had expectations. I made my expectation, uh, I made uh, the Lord's expectation my expectation. Did you get that? What the Lord wanted from my child, I made that as my expectation. And that was Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. If we make the Lord's expectation our child's expectation, then my expectation is automatically fulfilled. Praise God. Did you get that? If I make as a father what the Lord wants from my child and I train them in that direction, then I am at much ease. So what do I have to do? I have to train my daughters, my sons in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. And I say, I don't have any expectation, my daughter, my son, but I have my expectation. Seek the first the kingdom of God. That's it. And I can sleep nicely. And if the child does that, that is a basic foundation. The child will grow up in the fear, in the admonition and discipline of the Lord. And the child will have right priority in his or her life. And the parents will be at much at peace. And that is why Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Why do we do that? Because we have. We have. Yes. We have expectation, that is why we provoke them to wrath. But bring them in the training and admonition of the Lord. Matthew 6, 33. Amen. My dear young children, our parents may not know Android technology. Our parents may not know many of the technological things. But let me tell you, they work this law day and night to bring you up. Remember that. 
and the white hairs have sufficient experience to counsel and advise you. Amen. 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 Thank you. Can I say one last yes. thing? I'm just reminded of 1 Corinthians 15.10. Uh, Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace, His grace toward me but was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And I'd just like to close in saying, at the end of the day, we all need the grace of God. Because none of us will do it perfectly. Uh, kids, your parents will make mistakes. They are human. Yes. And parents, your children will make mistakes. They are human as well. And as much as we need God's grace towards us daily, because we're not perfect towards our Heavenly Father, we need to give the same grace. Children to our parents and parents to our children. We are all in it together uh, in this sinful world, striving to follow God's grace and to be more like Christ. But when, while we get to that point, uh, mistakes will be made and we will need the grace of God. So whether your kids are doing great, that's the grace of God. You know? Whether they're not doing so great, then that's the grace we need. We need the grace of God to overcome that situation. So at any point, we all are in that situation. And at the end of the day, all we can say is, you know, to God be the glory. Any result we can have is just because He was given. No, thank you so much. And I, I, I'm sorry, I know you said close, but I just want to add, I'm not anywhere near their level right now. But one thing I just really want to add is that for me, the biggest moments when I learned the most is when I started seeing my parents not as just some abstract or bigger than life or um, they're always perfect. I, once I recognize that they're humans and they're going to have fallacies, it helped me realize how broken I am. I look back at how much I've messed up and how much I've disrespected them and how much I have brought pain into their lives and how much they still choose to love me and pour into me and still take care of me. And I don't know if this is everyone's story, but I, every, everything you, you all said just reminded me of my dad. My dad would uh, come into my room at night if we had a fight. And he'd wake me up in the dead of night, it's midnight, and he said, hey, we didn't finish what we were talking about earlier. And he would apologize, because he said we couldn't go to bed angry, we couldn't leave this unresolved. And that stuck with me, because the next time we had a fight, and we had our fights, we had plenty of them. They got louder, they got heated, the loud and he did. I couldn't go to sleep. I went to his room and woke him up and my mom. My mom said, what are you doing in the room? And I said, I, said, I couldn't go to sleep because we had an argument and then we just went to bed. And for the most part, we never left it like that. But there's such a bonus on us. And it doesn't matter what your age is as well. If you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, you are a child of God. And the Lord is working for you as well. And if He's asking you to humble yourself and to show love and extend grace, do it. You don't have to wait for the other person. Jesus did it for His enemies. Our parents are much, much better, greater, sweeter images of God for us in this world. We can do that. And I, and I think for parents, like one thing that really encouraged me is that, and I hope, and I hope this gives you freedom, is that you don't have to have it all together. It's okay to show your kids, hey, I have mistakes, I have flaws, my past wasn't perfect. I genuinely grew up until the moment I left college and thought no adult in my assembly ever made a mistake, including my parents. <laughs> that they were perfect. And they were great people. But that isn't the image we need to portray. And I think many of us, children and adults alike, are chasing this image of something that is never meant to really be real. The, per the perfect image is Christ. And we cling to that. Just as they've been sharing, I'm just repeating what they said. We grasp to that perfect image of Christ. And that gives us so much freedom to say, hey, you know what, I don't have it all put together, but God is putting me together. God is making me a whole beautiful picture. And we all get to be a part of that together. And I hope that you get that freedom, that ability to go up to your child and say, I don't have it all together. I don't know what the future holds, but we're going to walk into it together. Because Christ is walking before us and He's walking in us. And that's all we need. We don't have to have a game plan. We don't have to have an eight-year plan. We don't have to have everything figured out. 
And that goes for all of us. Because God genuinely loves us. And he's just, he's, he, his love is so unimaginable. And if we can show that love even an iota of a fraction to each other and to this world, I'm telling you. Like, we don't have to worry about any of these problems. Our problems will be, uh, we can't get enough of the love that we have from them. And so I just want to encourage you guys with that. And um, we are kind of reaching the end. So I think we'll just go ahead and uh, close it out here. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. Can we just give them a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so again, I just want to encourage the, uh, the Jews of the other final thoughts you want to. I just wanted to encourage, uh, like I said, as you guys begin this journey, trying to figure out where do I go from here, prayer, getting to his word, um, but we're, they're resources. They're not going any, anywhere. They're going to be here this weekend. Talk to them. And if you can, um, if you want to invest in any sort of these resources that are available, do that as well. You know, many great men and women have uh, labored into books and resources to share, to help us understand better what the Lord has for us. And so I just want to encourage you, as you begin this journey, access all those resources. Um, and so I just thank you again for being so patient and for listening to us. And yeah, I just wanted to see if you all have any other disclosing thoughts that you just want to share real quick. Or, um, yeah, so I'm just going to ask for the need then just to um, just share just a real quick about it. Yeah, and then um, if you wanted to just also share about this and then you just close out. Okay. All right, so we'll close out for just a minute. Um, but I felt burdened about this very topic for quite a while. And I just want to share it extremely briefly, but it's here, it's a resource that is in the back corner. So it's not the other book table, although definitely visit that table. Phenomenal resources that personally have changed my life. But th there's a question. This group right here and this group on the younger half has been my passion in life. And what I mean by that is I long to see this generation be unconditional followers of Jesus Christ, just like you all desire. We want them to love the Lord Jesus wholeheartedly. But what is the bridge between coming to know Jesus Christ as our Savior and giving everything to Him as in every part of our life? And you know, we've talked about it, all of us have talked about it, that it looks different for every life. But the heart behind it doesn't change. And so the Lord burdened me about 15 years ago when I was 20 years old to write this book, but I, I waited about 12 years to do it because pieces were coming together. And ultimately there's a book called, What If Jesus Meant What He Said? And what I mean is, what if Jesus meant what He said about our career choices? What if Jesus meant what He said about the way we post on social media? And you're like, did He talk about that? Well, there, there's a lot of guidance. What if he meant what he said about our finances? What if he meant what he said about suffering? What if he meant what he said about our attitude, about forgiveness? And so this book is not a book that says, you need to live your life this way. Instead it says, if Jesus meant what he said, based on his words, we have to ask ourselves certain questions about every area of our life. So this book would apply just as much to any of my uncles or aunties over here, to the youngest person over here. It doesn't matter where you are in life. But every chapter has questions. Lots of questions. And then questions at the end of the chapter. So here's what I want to encourage you. If you have young people in your home, pick one up and go through it together. Because you'll find that together the Holy Spirit challenges and convicts you. Or if you're working with young people at your assembly, do it together so you can have these discussions. And what you're going to see is a lot of things will come to the surface, but then those are things for the Holy Spirit to deal with. And let me say this as one small word, because I don't want any misunderstanding. If you can't afford it, don't even come ask me. Just take it. And if and anything that does come from it goes to a girl's school over in... A girl's school over in Senegal anyway. So it, it, this is... I just say that from my heart, please. Just use it as the Lord guides you. But please, ask hard questions. Don't settle for external results. We pray for a generation that earnestly loves our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for just this time. We know that these things are not easy to discuss.
fact, sometimes they're painful. But I appreciate what Christian shared. How sometimes our kids or people in our life respond differently than we would ever choose. And it's not that we weren't walking with you. It's, it's that we realize your ways and your thoughts are above ours. And sometimes it takes longer than we desire to see the change that we wish we would see. But Lord, my prayer is twofold. One, encourage. Please encourage every person here. Encourage the parents who have faithfully sought your face and though with many flaws, have sought to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And as my brother just mentioned, have invested so much into their precious children. God, encourage them and remind them that their labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that he who began a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And Lord, for all of us, I pray that we would be exhorted. I know for my own heart, Lord, I need to change. So Lord, I pray that whatever you've convicted us on in this meeting, that we would not quickly get up and leave and think my, and not think on it again, but rather let what you have convicted of us on have its full effect that we might become more like your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this all in his precious name. Amen.